Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today we will go over femoral shaft fractures and everything you should know as a medical student. Here's the outline on what we'll be discussing today. Time for the first case. How would you read these x-rays? We have three views of a right femur demonstrating a comminuted displaced mid-shaft femur fracture with a large butterfly fragment. This injury was treated with a retrograde intramedullary nail. Femoral shaft fractures can occur from high energy injuries or low energy injuries. High energy injuries such as a motor vehicle accident are more common in the younger population whereas a lower energy injury such as a fall from standing is more common in the elderly population. Femoral shaft fractures can lose a large amount of blood. If the fracture is closed, they can lose between 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters of blood. If the fracture is open, that number is doubled to 2,000 to 3,000 milliliters of blood. If the patient has sustained bilateral femoral shaft fractures, studies have shown that the patient is at higher risk of pulmonary complications and mortality. Vascular injuries are uncommon with these injuries, but they do occur 1.6% of the time. It is important to evaluate the distal pulses and examine for any signs of an expanding hematoma. When evaluating a femoral shaft fracture, you always need to evaluate for an ipsilateral femoral neck fracture. The reported incidence of having a femoral neck fracture with a femoral shaft fracture is between 2 to 6 percent. These injuries are reported in the literature as being missed 19 to 31 percent of the time. Tornetta found that by obtaining four images, they were able to reduce the delay in diagnosis of femoral neck fracture by 91 percent. In their study, they obtained preoperative AP hip x-rays internally rotated 15 to 20 degrees, preoperative fine cut CT scan of the hip, intraoperative AP and lateral fluoroscopy of the affected hip, and postoperative x-rays of the hip. Why do you think they internally rotated the hip 15 to 20 degrees? This is because the femoral neck is anniverted 15 to 20 degrees and allows for the best view of the femoral neck. If there is a femoral neck fracture, they will most likely be vertically oriented, non-displaced, and located in the basal cervical area. You should always fix the femoral neck fracture first prior to fixing the femoral shaft. Ideally, you will fix the femoral neck fracture with a DHS or three percutaneous screws with a retrograde nail. Studies have demonstrated that using two implants compared to one reduces the risk of malreduction when fixing both the femoral neck and femoral shaft. The images on the right demonstrate two implants versus one implant. The image that uses a retrograde nail and three percutaneous screws has a lower risk of malreduction. We will now turn our attention towards some pertinent anatomy that you should be aware of. The femoral shaft has an anterior bow to it. Next is the isthmus, which is the narrowest aspect of the intramedullary canal. The linea aspera is located in the posterior middle third of the femoral shaft and acts as a compressive strut against the anterior femoral bow. The medial aspect of the femoral shaft is under compressive forces, whereas the lateral aspect of the femoral shaft is under tensile forces. The distal femur is trapezoidal in shape. The axial CT scan on the top right demonstrates how the anterior aspect is narrower than the posterior aspect. This is important because when you're placing your screws, you must confirm their length by obtaining a 30 degree internal rotation view and a 20 degree external rotation view. These views help confirm the length of your screw and confirm that they are not protruding too far out of the bone. There are two major arteries that supply the lower extremity. The femoral artery divides into the profunda femoris and the superficial femoral artery. The profunda femoris supplies the femoral shaft and surrounding musculature. If there is a disruption in this artery, it will result in hemorrhage, whereas if you disrupt the superficial femoral artery, this will lead to distal ischemia as this artery divides into the popliteal artery, which further divides into the anterior tibial artery and posterior tibial artery. The picture on the right illustrates the arteries around the femur and the specific divisions. As you can see, the profunda femoris supplies the femoral shaft with perforating arteries, whereas the superficial femoral artery descends through the leg and enters the distal extremity as a popliteal artery. There are three major nerves that you should be aware of in this area. They are the sciatic, the femoral, and the obturator nerves.
There are several deforming forces that act on the femoral shaft. The proximal deforming forces are the iliopsoas, which causes flexion as it attaches to the lesser trochanter. The gluteus minimus and gluteus medius causes abduction when it attaches to the greater trochanter. The distal fragment is deformed by the adductors, which cause adduction and flexion by the gastrocnemius. The picture on the right demonstrates these deforming forces. It is pertinent to understand these forces as these forces can hinder your reduction in the operating room. There are three compartments to the thigh, anterior, posterior, and adductor. The anterior compartment comprises the sartorius and the quadriceps muscles. The posterior consists of the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. The adductor compartment consists of the gracilis, adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus. When evaluating femoral shaft fractures, you should obtain several x-rays. You should obtain an AP pelvis, AP and lateral of the hip and femur. You want to pay particular attention towards the femoral neck looking for any fracture like we previously discussed. You will want to obtain a CT of the hip. On the right, you can see a nice example of a femoral shaft fracture with a femoral neck fracture. A fracture classification that you may be asked about while on rotations is the Winquist hansen classification for femoral shaft fractures. This classification was used in the past to evaluate if the fracture needed to be locked or not and what would be the weight-bearing status postoperatively. However, with today's current technology, this classification does not aid in management as we have full locking capabilities of our implants and we routinely encourage full postoperative weight bearing with intramedullary nails. This classification is broken down into five subtypes based on the amount of comminution. Zero is when there's no comminution, one is when there's insignificant amounts of comminution, two is when there's comminution but there's still greater than 50% cortical contact, three is when there's comminution with less than 50% cortical contact, and four is when there's fracture that is segmental with no cortical contact. You may need to place skeletal traction temporarily for open or severely displaced femoral shaft fractures. If you need to place skeletal traction, you should attach no more than 1 9th or 15% of the patient's body weight to the pins. There are two locations that can be used when placing your traction pin. You can place a pin in the distal femur or the proximal tibia. If you are placing a pin in the distal femur, you should place the pin medial to lateral to avoid injuring the femoral artery and place it at the upper pole of the patella and in the center of the femur in the anterior posterior plane. The diagram on the right demonstrates the approximate location of where you should place this pin. It is important that you do not violate the joint capsule when placing your distal femur traction pin. If you choose to place your pin in the proximal tibia, you should place the pin laterally to medially to avoid injuring the common peroneal nerve. The pin should be placed 2 cm posterior and 2 cm inferior to the tibial tubercle. The image on the right demonstrates the approximate location of where you should place your tibial pin. Alternatively, you can use cutaneous traction, otherwise known as Buck's traction. You should place 5 to 7 pounds of weight through the device. There's actually no difference in pain ratings between skeletal and cutaneous traction in the first 24 hours prior to surgical intervention. Cutaneous traction can be applied faster and without having to place a pin in the patient's bone. Historically, these injuries could be treated non-operatively, but today, all of these injuries are treated operatively unless the patient is too sick to be operated on or adamantly refuses surgery. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable and damage control orthopedics is chosen, an external fixator can be placed for temporary stabilization. The external fixator can be converted to a nail within two to three weeks. Open reduction internal fixation is not the preferred treatment option for someone who has an isolated femoral shaft fracture as it has an increased risk of infection, non-unions, and failure. Intramedullary nails are the preferred treatment modality. It is important to realize that the malunion rates increase when the starting point of the nail is opposite of the fracture site. For example, if you have a distal femoral shaft fracture and you choose to place an anagrade nail, the risk of malunion will be higher than if you used a retrograde nail.
When reaming for a nail, you should ream greater than 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters above your desired nail. The gold standard for treating femoral shaft fractures is to use an anagrade reamed locked intramedullary nail. Reaming allows for an increase in the union rate, a decreased time to union without an increase in pulmonary complications. Studies have demonstrated that if an unreamed nail is used, the non-union rate is four times higher. An advantage to reaming is that you can place a larger nail and you allow the medullary canal to be more tube-like, which allows for an improved fit. There are several risk factors when placing an anagrade nail. The patient is at an increased risk of developing hip pain, weakness in the abductors and quadriceps, decrease in the range of motion to the hip, formation of heterotopic ossification, and an iatrogenic femoral neck fracture. You should lock the nail dynamically if the fracture is transverse in orientation, otherwise you should lock the nail statically. There are two entry points when placing an anagrade nail, either a piriformis or trochanteric entry point. An advantage of placing a piriformis entry point is that the implant is collinear with the femur. If you place the nail too laterally, you risk fracturing the medial cortex or placing the femur into varus. If you place the nail too medially, you can increase the risk of causing an iatrogenic femoral neck fracture. In addition, a piriformis entry point will damage the abductors more than a trochanteric starting point. Lastly, the blood supply can be disrupted, leading to avascular necrosis of the femoral head. If you choose a trochanteric entry point, you must realize that this is not collinear with the femur. If you place the implant too laterally, this will cause varus alignment. Ideally, you want to aim for the medial tip of the greater trochanter, but this does vary based off of your implant. Like we already talked about, this starting point causes less damage to the abductors. We will now turn our attention to retrograde nailing. Some indications on why you would choose the starting point opposed to an anagrade nail is if there's an ipsilateral femoral neck or acetabulum fracture, if there's a floating knee, polytrauma patients, bilateral femur fractures as this allows you to drape both legs at the same time, morbid obesity as it can be quite difficult to get the proper starting point for an anagrade nail, distal third femoral shaft fractures, or patients that are pregnant as this can limit the amount of radiation to the mother's abdomen. Some inherent risks for placing a retrograde nail are the development of chronic knee pain, retropatellar arthritis, and loss of knee range of motion. Let's now discuss the entry point for retrograde nails. When placing your retrograde nail, you should be 2 to 4 millimeters anterior to Blumensatz line. The nail should be parallel to the posterior cortex on the lateral x-ray. If you place the nail posterior to Blumensatz line, you risk damaging the ACL. On the AP x-ray at the knee, you should aim for the center of the intercodular notch. When obtaining your starting point, you need to flex the knee 30 to 50 degrees as this will help open up the space and elevate the patella. The nail should be placed 2 to 5 millimeters beyond the articular cartilage. On the right is an illustration that highlights the proper placement of a retrograde nail in which the nail is anterior to Blumensatz and parallel to the posterior cortex and centered in the femur. There are many potential complications that can occur with this injury. You can have heterotopic ossification, avascular necrosis, iatrogenic femoral neck fractures. Perforation of the anterior cortex can occur if your starting point for an anagrade nail is too anterior and you can ream out the anterior cortex. Pudendal nerve injury can occur with excessive traction from a fracture table. This injury is reported in the literature as occurring 10% of the time. Injury to this nerve would lead to erectile dysfunction. Injury to the peroneal nerve can occur. Compartment syndrome of the non-injured leg can occur when placing the non-injured leg in the hemilithotomy position. Femoral artery or nerve injuries can occur. Anterior cortical perforation of the distal femur can occur if there's a mismatch of the radius of curvature between your implant and the femur or if the starting point is too posterior for an anagrid nail. Delayed unions can occur. Treatment for delayed unions can be either with reamed exchange nailing or dynamization of the pre-existing nail. Dynamization is when you remove the static locking screw to allow for compression along the nail. This works approximately 50% of the time. Aseptic non-unions can occur. 
The treatment will be to perform a reamed exchange nailing or open reduction internal fixation with or without bone graft. Septic nonunions would be treated with debridement, appropriate antibiotics, and exchange solid nail with lavage or two-stage procedure. A solid nail would be more appropriate in the infection setting as this has less central dead space. Malunions can occur. It is important to know that internal rotation is more common with the use of a fracture table and less than 15 degrees of rotation from the contralateral leg is acceptable. You can have failure of the hardware and like we previously talked about, you can have hip pain or develop a limp secondary to antegrade nail. Lastly, you can develop knee pain or retropatellar arthritis secondary to a retrograde nail. As you can see, there are many complications that can occur with these injuries. It is important to educate and inform the patient prior to surgical intervention. Let's now finish our discussion with some PIMP questions. Question 1. What is the classification for femoral shaft fractures? Winquist Hansen. Question 2. What structure is at risk if you place a retrograde nail posterior to Blumenstadt's line? The ACL. Question 3. What are the two starting points that can be used with an antegrade nail? Trochanteric and piriformis. Question 4. Antegreed nails can cause what kind of pain? Hip pain. Retrograde nails can cause what kind of pain? Knee pain. Question 6. Which direction should you place a proximal tibial traction pin? Lateral to medial. Question 7. What are the three characteristics of a femoral neck fracture if present with a femoral shaft fracture? Vertical, non-displaced, and basal cervical. Question 8. What are the four images that you need to obtain to aid in identifying a femoral neck fracture with the femoral shaft fracture? A preoperative internal rotation AP x-ray of the hip, preoperative fine cut CT scan of the hip, intraoperative AP and lateral of the hip, and postoperative x-rays of the hip. Question 9. What does it mean when someone says they are going to dynamize the femoral nail? This means removing the proximal static screw to convert the nail from static to dynamic. Question 10. What is the incidence of femoral neck fractures with femoral shaft fractures? 2 to 6%. And that's all for femoral shaft fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.